This is the final part of our program where you'll hear from the two of the four storytellers that, as I said earlier, have travelled great distances to be with you today to share their stories. And then we'll move to our final closing keynote speaker. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome all the way from Uganda, Robert Mwadime. He's going to be, yes, let's give a rousing welcome to Robert. Robert is going to be sharing a story with you of how getting integration right for the most vulnerable populations requires constant fine tuning and course correction. Now there's a video of Robert and his team on the FHI 360 website of the project. I encourage you all to watch that video because someone makes a comment in it that is the most profound statement I have heard about the value of failure. It's a very simple statement. I want to read it to you and then invite Robert to the stage. In that video, I think one of Robert's team says, failure is a means of getting things right. Failure is a means of getting things right. A very simple sentence, but one I think that is absolutely on the mark. Robert. Wow. Let me see by show of hands how many of us at one time or another you've wished that you could make major change to the programs where you've been working. I didn't expect so many hands. Let's make them fewer. How many of us actually have managed to do it? <laughs> wow, yes, I knew it, because it's not easy. We've just been discussing this this afternoon, and we all know either because of the design or otherwise is not easy. I remember in 2013, exactly 18 months after we had been operational, our program, we invited USID, the government partners, and some local leaders to come and visit some of the villages where we had been working. This was normal. We usually do that every quarter. We call them field learning uh, events. After the event, we sat down with this partner, uh, stakeholders, and they were to brief us what they had observed. And as usual, you know, USID and other partners spent almost 45 minutes telling us how good our work was, you know, and they told us how we are going to achieve our good results and what excitement we had caused within the communities. Of course, we were excited. But at the end, one person said, but I had observed that as we walked through the villages, we visited the households of some of your group members, but their neighbors looked very different. They didn't seem to have done exactly what the others were doing. And then another person said, actually remember when we went to a certain household, we found that even though you have these people within your groups who are on these households, they have household members who didn't seem even to have an idea of what you people talk about. And they were not even practicing some of the behaviors that you've been implementing. And voila, it rang a bell among my staff. So after the meeting, my staff es escalated this. And the way they put it is someone is questioning our assumptions of how we implement our program. And so we decided that during our next learning events, we would learn about this specific issue. You see, this is the difference between the program that I work with and the one that most of you work in. And I'm not boasting, but Community Connector was actually designed by USID as a multi-sectorial program, which brought in three different sectors, health, agriculture, and economic strengthening. But in addition to that, USID had actually designed a very interesting, innovative approach called collaborative learning and adaptation. They had allocated and earmarked some resources for that, especially for the learning event, over $800,000. But in addition to that, they had allowed us to do adaptations as we see necessary, and as we learn, so that we could change the program so that we could meet the program's uh, 
results more efficiently or even optimize them. So during our next learning event, we decided actually to do learning concerning this particular issue. And they learned, and at the end we analyzed the data, presented to USID and told USID that we are going to make some changes. So we had observed some things. And USID blessed us, after a long discussion with them, they blessed us and told us yes. So we held what we called an adaptation conference. And during that conference, three decisions were made. One, that we needed actually to invite a new partner to be able to address the needs of the people that we were leaving out. This included the youth and teenage mothers who we had not actually or were not being included in our program. We also needed to include people living with HIV who are not part of our program activities. And thirdly, we needed to include the very poor within our communities. You see, these three groups of people would actually not join the kinds of groups that we were working with or that were a mechanism of entering the communities. So at the end, we costed how much all these changes would mean to us. And we needed two million extra dollars. Now this is, you know, it's very impossible, especially for a program that is a fixed price contract, the community connector. So the issue is you have this piece of cake and it's not going to grow no matter how much noise you make with USID. And it only meant that the pieces of cake that we had cut among us to ourselves at the design level, we were going to change the size of those pieces of cake. And it's a very painful endeavor, but it happened. Now it happened because of four different reasons. One, we found that we actually, oh, is this working? much slower than I thought. Okay, so one was actually because we needed to bring in a new partner, as I say, and now for the reasons why we felt, why I think this happened. First is because of the trust that was between the different partners. We must have trust between the staff, between the donors, and other stakeholders that we work with. But apart from that, we needed to have effective communication. All right? We needed to have effective communication with the different partners, and especially USID. Now, because we had involved them from the beginning through the learning exercise, the adaptation conferences, and the decisions that we were making, it was easier for us to go back to them and ask for modifications, which they were gladly to give us of our contract. But we also needed to be flexible. Not only ourselves, every partners and stakeholders. We needed to be flexible on the finances that we were using. We needed to be flexible on the roles that we had and we needed to be flexible on our expectations. You know everybody has expectations and everybody thinks that this is what we shall have to be doing to the end. But the last one is that we needed also to have some leadership and management on making it all happen. So now at the end of it all, the question was that actually we had made all this to happen and actually we had managed to bring in close to, uh, six, um, close to uh, 50,000, 51,000 people into the program who otherwise would have excluded from this particular program. And this affected our results and made our results even much better. And that's why if you look at what we have achieved over that short period, the question is whether collaborative learning and adaptation should actually be an exercise that most of us need to do to use is to foster the integrations that we are doing. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Robert.